It's all quiet in the underground bunker. Doors closed, locks bolted. But the great one isn't just resting on his laurels. He's making sure your weekend is even better by giving you his best. This is the best of Mark Levin. You know, we vote for like a month, but we celebrate Thanksgiving once. Our blessings we celebrate once officially. But we vote off and on for like uh, two months. Very weird. And you know, I go through all the news. A lot of it's depressing. Think about things, mull them over, noodle over them to try and try and figure out what exactly is going on or what exactly we need to do so we can uh, talk about these things. And one thing is incredible. Every Sunday show, every virtually website, every event is about Trump. Every one of them. Every one of them. And even more than that, they're all pushing to get him indicted. All of them. You have even a very rarely watched show called Firing Line. They stole the title from Bill Buckley uh, with a Yenta who runs the thing, Hoover. Her grandfather, her great-grandfather was Herbert Hoover, so she's qualified. And uh, former Attorney General Bill Barr is on there. Now, why do you think he's on there? Does anybody really care what he has to say? No. Nobody cares what Bill Barr has to say, but they know what he's going to say about Donald Trump. And Bill Barr is very, very angry. So he wants to see Donald Trump in federal prison. Think about that. Think about that. And so they think that by bringing him on, that will resonate with the bureaucrats over at the Department of Justice, because after all, he ran that place twice. Then, what, then over on Deface the Nation, we have Zoe Lofgren. Remember her? Very pretty lady, that Zoe, from uh, San Jose, California. And she says, we're going to release all the evidence, the J6 committee. It's going to show that Trump was the center of the overthrow of the government. Oh, okay. Then they have Adam Schiff on this week. He's just piling on, you know, Moscow Adam. He says, of course you can indict him, and they should indict him, and it's good that there's a special counsel, and of course he used Twitter to incite the attack on the Capitol. And then you have head case Adam Kingsinger on the Constipated News Network. How's that? for a diversity of opinion. And all of them want Trump indicted. Then you go to the Hill newspaper, which is a creature of the Hill, and they talk to experts who say, well, of course Trump should be indicted, and of course there's enough evidence to indict him. Wow. National Review, legal analyst, Andy McCarthy, well, of course, he's invited the indictments. Say what? Oh, yeah. He invited them, don't you know? All of them. Out of Manhattan, out of Atlanta, uh, yes, out of Washington. I mean, they told us to put all this stuff behind us, but they won't stop talking about this. In fact, they won't stop promoting this. And then we have the special counsel who, who is admired and promoted by Media Matters. Now, what does that tell you? So they must know something about this guy that we don't, but we know a little bit more thanks to independent conservative media. Post-millennial, great site. Joshua Young, wife of Trump special counsel, produced Michelle Obama documentary and donated thousands to the Biden campaign. Oh, my goodness. Now, anytime Ginny Thomas does anything, they blame her and Clarence Thomas, remember? He must recuse himself. Oh, my God. But here... We have a special counsel. And remember on Friday when they announced it? Remember when the Attorney General of the United States, Meritless Garland, talked about the man's credentials? Oh, he prosecutes war crimes at the Hague. 
uh, excuse me, we're talking about a document case. Doesn't matter. Oh, and he was an assistant U.S. attorney and a deputy assistant associate district attorney, and he was a special prosecutor. And a, oh my God, this guy, he's got the creds. Oh my God. FEC records reveal that the wife of supposedly impartial special counsel Biden Attorney General Merrick Garland's tapped to investigate Trump donated at least $2,000 to Joe Biden's presidential campaign two years ago. On Friday, U.S. Attorney General Meritless Garland announced that Jack Smith, Jack Smith, a veteran career prosecutor, quote unquote, would serve as special counsel to lead the ongoing investigations into Donald Trump being conducted by Biden's Department of Justice. And on Monday, today, records show Smith's wife, Kathy Chevigny, is a high-dollar donor, quote-unquote, to Joe Biden and contributed to various high-profile Democrat efforts. On Twitter, Henry Rogers tweeted a screen grab showing that Caddy, that, uh, what is her name? Yeah, Caddy Cavigny, through her production company, Big Mouth Productions, gave $2,000 to the Biden for President campaign in 2020. MAGA War Room on Twitter wrote, wow, the wife of Special Prosecutor Jack Smith was a high-dollar donor to Joe Biden's presidential campaign. Shaveni also gave to anti-Semite squad member Congresswoman Rashid, Rashida Tlaib. Let me get this straight. So the Special Counsel's wife gave to Rashida Tlaib, the anti-Semite's campaign, who's a Marxist? On Getter, journalist Paul Sperry wrote, breaking, FEC records reveal the wife of the supposedly impartial special counsel, Biden Attorney General Merrick Garland, tapped to investigate Trump, donated at least 2000 to Joe Biden's presidential campaign in 2020. And Caddy Chevigny, the wife of newly appointed special counsel Jack Smith, also gave money to Democratic Representative Rashida Tlaib. The Islamic member of the radical squad who said of Trump, we're going to impeach the Emmer. Oh. I'm sure for Jack Reed it was love at first sight. On IMDb, Kedish Shavinia is listed as a producer in the Michelle Obama documentary, Becoming. Should be called Unbecoming. On Friday, Garland said of Shavinia's husband, I signed an order appointing Jack Smith to serve as special counsel. The order authorizes him to continue the ongoing investigation into both of the matters that I've just described and to prosecute any federal crimes that may arise from those investigations. Mr. Smith is a veteran career prosecutor. And that move came only three days after Trump announced that he would be running for president in 2024. Now, ladies and gentlemen, so all these Trump haters were on the Sunday shows. All of these so-called news outlets have an enormous amount of money to conduct investigations. You ever see these New York Times pieces with like five reporters looking into some schlub? Five report. We're on the case, for God's sakes. We, we know. How is it that this special prosecutor's wife received no scrutiny? None. But there's more. The Daily Caller News Foundation, special counsel investigating Trump was key figure in IRS targeting scandal. Say what? Meritless Garland didn't mention this either. Neither did any of the major news, quote unquote, outlets. Jack Smith, the special counsel appointed by Attorney General Meritless Garland to investigate former President Donald Trump, was a key figure in the IRS infamous targeting of conservative nonprofits, according to a 2014 report by Republicans on the House Oversight Committee. I would encourage the Republicans in the House to find out how this guy got appointed Jack Smith, because obviously he's a hack. On October 8, 2010, Smith, then chief of the Department of Justice Criminal Division's Public Integrity Section, that is a big deal. That's where all the investigations of public figures take place or are approved, called a meeting with former IRS official Lois Lerner, quote, to discuss how the IRS could assist in the criminal enforcement of campaign finance laws against politically active nonprofits, quote unquote, according to testimony from Richard Pilger, then director of the section's election crimes branch and subordinate of Smith's to the Oversight Committee. 
Lerner eventually resigned from the IRS in 2015 following criticism over targeting conservative Tea Party groups when denying or delaying tax-exempt status. This seems egregious to me. Could we ever charge an 18 U.S.C. Section 371 conspiracy to violate laws of America for misuse of such nonprofits to get around existing campaign finance laws and limits? Smith wrote in the email to colleagues per the Oversight Committee. In other words, he really wanted to prosecute these conservative groups and Tea Party groups. Can't we figure out how to do it? We have 18 U.S.C. 371. Can't we use that? Can't we? Can't we? His email suggested that the department investigate conservative nonprofits that reportedly may have violated campaign finance laws, according to the New York Times. The impetus for the meeting was President Obama's public criticism of the Supreme Court ruling in Citizens United versus FC, FEC, according to the report. The Times article described how 501 registered charities with ties to conservative lawmakers were receiving donations from corporations and interest groups. At the time, these groups were also lobbying the same lawmakers on Capitol Hill. The Times writing, Smith's meeting with Lerner shortly followed the article. Oh, this guy, he's, he's, he's really, really lousing. And Smith also urged the IRS to be more vigilant to the opportunities for more crime in the 501c4 area. IRS officials under Lerner were later involved in selecting groups with the words Tea Party, Patriot, or 912 in their names for audits. Following Lerner's meeting with Smith, the IRS's scrutiny of nonprofit 501c3 and c4 tax exempt statuses applied by for these groups prevented them from fully participating in the 2012 presidential election involving Obama. Lerner later resigned, of course, and pled the fifth when questioned about her actions. Smith and his team had serious conflicts of interest stemming from their interaction with the IRS, the report alleged. He was also leader, Smith, of former Republican Bob McDonald, Governor Bob McDonald of Virginia on federal corruption charges in 2014 for accepting gifts from a lobbyist that he later repaid. The U.S. Supreme Court unanimously reversed his conviction in 2016, and all charges were later dismissed, though commentators have argued that the conviction stopped him from running for president in 2016. Now, many of you may not know this, even though we discussed it at the time. This was such an overreach to go after Bob McDonald for taking gifts, which, by the way, was legal in the state of Virginia. It was such an outrageous case that was brought against him that the entirety of the Supreme Court threw it out. Nine to zero, wasn't even close. That shows you what we're dealing with here in Jack Smith. In his role as special counsel, Smith will oversee two investigations into Trump, one regarding, we know what they are. So here we have a guy, ladies and gentlemen, whose family, his family, Gave thousands of dollars to the Biden campaign <clears throat> who wanted to prosecute Tea Party groups and conservative groups under Lois Lerner's watch. Went after Governor Bob Mc McDonnell of Virginia in what is considered a horrendous case and even tried to turn his wife against him. And this is the guy that's picked by the Biden administration to go after Donald Trump. And then all the cheerleading on TV, because it's clear this hack reads the press, looks at the press. Oh, look, we looked at the New York Times about these conservative and Tea Party groups listening to the likes of a Bill Barr, a Zoe Lofgren, and Adam Schiff, listening to Adam Kingsinger. It's disgusting. All weekend long this has been going on. All weekend long. They don't want to talk about the Biden crime family, even there when it comes to the Republican. Can you believe they want to investigate them? I mean, come on. Inflation, you know, the price of, uh, of, uh, of quiche is right through the rear, you know. Mark Levin. Making your weekend even better. This is the best of Mark Levin. I was waiting for Chris Christie to quote another Reagan phrase, but of course he wouldn't do that. His 11th commandment. 
thou shalt not speak ill of another Republican. What about you, Mark? I'm not running for office. Period. I'm not running for president. I'm running from the president. See what I'm saying? So um, that he'll never say. Anyway, he'll never get elected. He Too much Hillary Clinton with the, you know, the disparaging of tens of millions of people. I'm surprised he didn't say, uh, and the deplorables. No. The deplorables. I need more spare ribs, sweetie. This is really an outrage. I mean, it's one after another here. Not to pile on the Daily Mail. Ready for this one, America? Biden agrees to pay climate reparations. U.S. will pay up to $1 billion to compensate developing countries for global warming. But gas guzzling China won't have to pay into global fund. All right, this is so horrific on so many levels. First of all, since when does a president have the power to just blow off a billion dollars like that? That's your money. That's my money. So they want to ha hire 87,000 new IRS agents to shake us down so leftists can get the money, so public sector unions can get the money, so third worlders can get the money, so they can redistribute wealth. Meanwhile, you are attacked as a hardworking American. It's just, it's just unbelievable. And people vote for this. We had a chance to put an end to this whole damn thing. Oh, it's Trump. You ready to hear this? You got to hear it. Joe Biden says the U.S. will sign up to a U.N.-backed fund to pay reparations to developing countries worse affected by climate change. So it, it just never ends. You see, climate change. If you were to ask Joe Biden, what is climate change? He couldn't even define it. What is it? How do they define it? What is it? Well, one degree southeast in Bolivia, based on our 112-day record-keeping score, they can't even define it. It is utterly elusive. But it is their religion, so it doesn't matter. And then you keep going. You've got to constrain what individuals can do. You've got to constrain and destroy capitalism. You have to have environmental justice reparation payments. It's just a whole new commie ideology that is Americanized. The creation of the fund was announced on Saturday. It was negotiated at the United Nations COPT7 27 rather summit in Egypt. It was originally known as a loss and damage fund and had been blocked by previous American administrations. But Joe's out there, and he wants to make a legacy, America. He is for the little guy, while he's destroying the little guy. The nations who will benefit from the funds are largely from Asia, Africa, Latin America, the Caribbean, the South Pacific. They say they were set to be worse affected by rising sea levels and other weather extremes blamed on carbon emissions created by wealthier countries. There you go. It's that damn capitalism. Why aren't they paying us for all the lush vegetation that they have as a result of carbon dioxide, Mr. Producer? They should be paying us. Why are we paying them? Last year, Biden was granted $1 billion, uh-oh, to help developing countries tackle climate change, although it's unclear if that cash will go into this fund. It doesn't matter. He'll take a billion dollars out of the Defense Department to do that. The president also faces uh, having his plan stymied by the GOP majority House, which would have to approve any funding mooted by the White House. But he gets around that. And then he has to have the law catch up with him, remember? Like the student law. All you suckers. All you millennial suckers who voted for Joe Biden because you thought he was Santa Claus. You thought you were going to get free money from the rest of us. Now what do you think? Bunch of suckers. There will be wrangles with fellow UN members over who pays what, which could well mean nothing gets done. Yes, let's hope. Donald Trump famously pulled the U.S. out of the 2015 UN Paris Accord on climate change. You know what? That took guts. and It was a great move. He's trying to save the American worker. 
saying it represented a bad deal for America. With DeSantis known to share many of the 45th president's views, China, the worst and world's biggest polluter, ready? Wouldn't have to contribute to any global fund because it's still considered a developing nature. Yes, developing ICBMs with nuclear warheads aimed at our cities. So despite its vast wealth, China's a developing country. They don't have to pay into this system. Have you ever seen a country more hell-bent on sabotaging itself, on committing suicide? Have you ever seen a country more hell-bent on it? It's really shocking. I haven't. But we had our chance. Just weren't enough of us. Just weren't enough of us. The German disaster. German, a disaster? Do tell. Well, there's an official in Germany who's now recommending stockpiling several crates of water and canned food. That's America in three years, if we don't get this thing under control. Germany was the wealthiest nation in Europe, the most industrial nation in Europe, the most self-sufficient nation in Europe, and now it's on its back. This is at Zero Hedge. The head of Germany's Federal Office of Civil Protection and Disaster Relief, BBK, Ralph Tesla, has warned citizens to prepare for short-term power outages, particularly in January and February, and to stock up on rations in advance. He said, we have to assume that there will be blackouts this winter. You folks in New England, New York area, Pennsylvania, you should pay attention because this is you soon. We have to assume that there, and uh, thanks for voting for Biden, those who did. Uh, you're going to get what you voted for. We have to assume there will be blackouts this winter. By that, I mean a regional and temporary interruption in the power supply. The cause will not be energy shortages, but also the targeted temporary shutdown of networks by operators with the aim of protecting the networks and not endangering the overall supply. We call that rationing. Some municipalities are not prepared, and despite German gas storage facilities being near capacity, experts think the stockpile will be enough to last the country through the winter. Excuse me, won't be enough uh, due to a lack of new supply from Russia. Oh, yeah, that's it. Well, in their case, it is because 60%, ready for this? 60% of their fuel they got from Russia. Now, who told them to cut it out? Mr. Producer, who told them to cut it out? The John Birch Society? No. Trump told him to cut it out. Did Christie tell him to cut it out? No. When I think of energy, I don't normally think of Christie. Do you, Mr. Producer? But now I am in a grotesque like methane. You realize Christie probably gives off two or three times the amount of methane as an average American? Wouldn't you guess that? And Bill Barr's probably up there somewhere. Just a guess. I, I mean, I, you know, inquiring minds don't want to know in my case. But you get the point. Mark Levin. You're listening to the best of Mark Levin. So who are the conservatives on MSNBC? Anybody know? There aren't any. Who are the conservatives on CNN? There aren't any. Who are the conservatives who write for the New York Times? I'm not talking about columnists. I'm talking about news people. There aren't any. Who are the conservatives that write for the Washington Post? There aren't any. Who are the conservative nightly news network hosts? Are they conservatives? There aren't any. Isn't that amazing? Not one. And of course, there are liberals all over Fox. Walk around Fox, you bump into them left and right. But that's not the case with these other networks. Who, who are the conservatives on The View? Not this Graham or whatever her name is. She's a uh, crackpot. There aren't any. Who are the conservatives on the late night comedy shows such as they are? Other than Gutfeld on Fox, on the networks I'm talking about, there aren't any. None. 
Who are the conservatives on the Today Show? Don't give me Bush. There aren't any. Who are the conservatives on Good Morning America? There aren't any. Who are conservatives on the CBS Morning Show? There aren't any. There aren't any. Who are the conservatives on 60 Minutes? There aren't any. On Meet the Press? There aren't any. It's a few rhino repubics. That's it. There aren't any. And that's why the propaganda and the lies and the intellectual corruption just go on and on and on. Like the Republicans are election deniers. Hakeem Jeffries comes from a family that is loaded with anti-Semites, especially his uncle. And Hakeem has never denounced anti-Semitism or his uncle. Maybe remember Professor Jeffries. Democrat poised to succeed Pelosi repeatedly denied legitimacy of Trump's 2016 election, just the news. How come this isn't leading any of the other networks? They keep talking about election deniers. His claims of a stolen election, voter suppression, have hardly gotten the same treatment as Trump and other Republicans who've raised ballot integrity issues. Now you see what's going on in Arizona? Even the Attorney General's office has said two of these counties, including Maricopa County, they have some explaining to do. That's not some conspiracy theorist. Those are real investigators. Jeffries, currently the House Democratic Conference Chairman, in line to be Speaker, not Speaker, Democrat leader, has tweeted that Trump cheated in the 2016 election and stole two Supreme Court seats. Lie, I'm quoting him, lie more than any administration in the history of the republic. Cheat, 2016 election, Russian interference. Steal, one or two Supreme Court seats. When will Republicans put country ahead of party, he tweeted. Jeffrey's denial of Trump's elections date to at least February 2018 when he launched a Twitter broadside against the 45th president. Quote, the more we learn about the 2016 election, the more illegitimate, in caps, it becomes, Jeffries tweeted from his congressional account four years ago, claiming Russian interference benefited Trump. Quote, America deserves to know whether we have a fake capital president in the Oval Office. In 2019, even though special counsel Robert Mueller had concluded Trump had not colluded with Russia, Jeffries claimed at a congressional hearing that Trump had been put into the White House quote, artificially, unquote. Quote, history will never accept you as a legitimate president, Jeffries tweeted from his personal account in 2020, referring to Trump. Now, in March 2021, March 2021, Jeffries claimed without evidence that Republicans had suppressed votes in prior elections. Quote, what kind of political party worships at the altar of voter suppression, he wrote, a morally bankrupt one, unquote. Though his language is similar to Republicans who are branded election deniers, Jeffries has not gotten the same negative attention that Trump or Arizona gubernatorial nominee Carrie Lake have received. Joe Concha, our friend, he noted the media's general silence and questioned whether Jeffries' ascension toward House Minority Leader might change things. Will the media label him an election denier in an effort to be consistent with the same applied to some GOP candidates in the 2022 midterms? No, they won't. Now, we're not going to play the whole 10 or 20 minutes that I've played for you before of election deniers in the Democrat Party. Going back to 2000, going back to 2004, going back to 2016 including members of the January 6th committee. The media know this. The Democrats know this. The Democrats keep putting out the big lie. The media keep regurgitating it because they're one and the same. One's an appendage to the other. And they know there's nobody to check them because there's no conservatives in the newsrooms. None. At NBC and CBS and ABC. None on their morning shows, none on their Sunday shows, none in their magazine shows, none in the news departments at the New York Times, none in the news departments at the Washington Post, none, zero. So there's no pushback. 
It's called propaganda. One party control of the media. Until Elon Musk, who they now hate and are trying to destroy, there was one party control with the oligarchs of big social media. So let us remind ourselves, not for 10 minutes, but it could go on and on and on for 12 minutes. Democrats denying election results. Cut 18, go. You can run the best campaign. You can even become the nominee. They call her Hillary. You can have the election stolen from you. How can you win with Russian interference, though? That's, That's a real what thing. I'm scared about no, in 2020. But, but rightly. Because right. I think he's an illegitimate president that didn't really win. So how do you, you know, fight against that in 2020? You are absolutely right. He is an illegitimate president in my mind. Would you be my vice president for candidate? <laughs> Folks, look, I absolutely agree. Trump didn't actually win the election in 2016. He lost the election, and he was put into office because the Russians interfered. Trump knows he's an illegitimate president. The president-elect, although legally elected, is not legitimate. I don't see the president-elect as a legitimate president. You said you believe that Russia's interference altered the outcome of the election. I do. We have a president who, if in fact it is proven, uh, has been assisted by the Russians and may in fact not be a legitimate president. The one thing that Trump is fearful of uh, when it comes to his being president is that finally we will see how illegitimate his victory actually was. I have an objection. I object to the 15 votes from the state of North Carolina. I object because people are horrified. He's an illegitimate president. Do you believe Trump is a legitimate president? What I believe is that there's no question that the outcome of this election was affected by the Russian interference. But there absolutely is a cloud of illegitimacy. So that legitimacy is in question, yes. So that was a very tainted election. And and in that sense, it's illegitimate. Why do you think the president is going to such great lengths to essentially prove that he beat you? Because he knows he didn't. He knows he's an illegitimate president. Stolen emails. Stolen drone. Stolen drone. Stolen election. Welcome to the world of unprecedented Trump. Did you believe President Trump is an illegitimate president? <laughs> Based on what I just said, which I can't retract. <laughs> the Russian attempt to, ha to have the election, and frankly, the FBI is uh, weighing in on the election, I think make the, make, makes his election illegitimate. There was a widespread understanding that this election was not on the level. We still don't know what really happened, Isaac. I mean, there's just a lot that I think will be revealed, history will discover, but you don't win by three million votes and have all this other shenanigan stuff going on and not come away with an idea like, whoa, something's not right here. The outcome of the election was affected by their interference, and now we need to know, you know to what degree, uh, if any, the Trump campaign was actually in collusion with the uh, with, so with Russia. He knows he's an illegitimate president. So of course he's obsessed with me, and I believe that it's a guilty conscience. We actually won the last presidential election, folks. They stole the last presidential election. And Al Gore won that election. I think he won anyway. Actually, I think <laughs> I carried Florida. Bush versus Gore. A court took away a presidency. If all the votes were counted in Florida, that Al Gore would be president today and George Bush would be back in office. I come from Florida, where you and others participated in what I call the United States coup d'etat. There's no doubt in my mind that Al Gore was elected president. I rise to object to the fraudulent 25 Florida electoral votes. I must object because of the overwhelming evidence of official misconduct, <laughs> delivery the fraud, chair, and an attempt the to chair must the remind It is signed by myself on behalf of my diverse constituents and the millions of Americans who have been disenfranchised by Florida's inaccurate vote count. The Supreme the, uh, Court, not the is, people of the United is, States, decided this election. Speaking to a Democratic group in Chicago Tuesday, he made it clear he thinks Al Gore was the winner. By the time it was over, our candidate had won the popular vote, and the only way they could win the election was to stop the voting in Florida. Catherine Harris, Jeb Bush, Jim Baker and the Supreme Court hadn't tampered with the results 
Al Gore would be president. The yeah, Supreme yes, Court elected the president. 2004, yeah. Al Gore won the state of Florida in 2000, although not the presidency. But the Supreme Court answered that's a large charge. The Supreme Court stopped the counting of the votes, and if they let the count go on, Al Gore would have got the necessary votes. The Supreme Court selected George W. Bush as the president. He was not elected. There is overwhelming evidence that George W. Bush did not win this election. What I observed uh, as a voter, as a citizen of Illinois, uh, four years ago were troubling evidence of the fact that not every vote was being counted. I don't think that George W. Bush won the election uh, in 2000 against Al Gore because I, th I think that he probably lost Florida and also that nationwide. If you invite me back on this show in about eight weeks, I think you're going to learn that Al Gore actually did get all the votes there. The court has been thwarting formation of the popular will. The most spectacular example being Bush versus Gore, where the majority by a 5-4 vote enjoined the count of more than 100,000 ballots in Florida and essentially gave America its first court-appointed president. I think in 2000, everybody thought, well, he did win the election, Al Gore. After the election, when you stole the election. All right, that's enough. There's a lot more. How dare these slimeballs call us election deniers when they've been doing this? for 22 years remember the disappearing mailboxes remember that the summer of 2020 that Trump and the postmaster general who was a major Trump donor were disappearing mailboxes particularly in minority and Democrat areas in order to affect mail-in ballots remember that mr. producer USA Today and the other media jumped all over it. Here it is. United States Postal Service removes thousands of mailboxes each year. In 2020, mail-in ballots make it political. By Katie Weddle, John Salmon, and Dak Lee. Will mail-in voting decide America's next president? A U.S. postal worker rolled through downtown Columbus, Ohio in late May, stopping to hoist iconic blue mailboxes onto a flatbed truck. Protests after George Floyd's death under the knee of a Minneapolis police officer had taken a destructive turn the night before. In front of the offices of the Columbus Dispatch, part of the USA Today network, a reporter asked the worker why he was taking the boxes. Because of the riots, he told her, and all more than 30 mailboxes disappeared from the city streets that day. Now, they didn't return until August 21, the same day Postmaster General Louis DeJoy testified to a Senate committee about postal cuts. In the meantime, across the United States, missing mailboxes had become a political hot button. I won't make you suffer through that. What was going on is the Democrats and the media were accusing Trump and the Republicans and the Postal Service under the Postmaster General, a major donor to Trump, to removing postal boxes in Democrat precincts to affect the outcome of the election. It never happened. That is, there was no political strategy to remove mailboxes to hurt Democrats in Democrat areas. They were looking at the mailboxes that weren't getting used. And so rather than spending money sending trucks there every day or twice a day, they removed them. Remember that Democrat scandal? Remember that, America? I want you folks to go to uh, YouTube, the ease of hacking voting machines. I am not saying voting machines have been hacked. I am not putting out any hypothesis. That's not my purpose here. My purpose is to expose the Democrat Party and the Democrat Party media. It's from three years ago. I want you to take a look at it, how hackers can target voting machines, NBC News, three years ago. Go to YouTube. The ease of hacking voting machines. I don't know how easy it is. I don't know how hard it is. I don't even know if it's possible. But NBC News did an entire segment on this. Almost five minutes. Five minutes. Dominion might want to sue them, by the way. Five minutes. How hackers can target voting machines. NBC News. Again, I don't pass judgment. Just take a look. Mark. The Vin.
The Great One makes your weekend even better. This is the best of Mark Levin. The uh, Supreme Court today, without opinion, without opining, under John Roberts, um, has ordered that President Trump's last six years of his tax returns are to be presented to the House of Representatives. Now, this is really an extraordinary ruling. To what ends will the House of Representatives, under the Democrats still, use President Trump's tax returns? For political ends, they will leak them. They will try and trigger further criminal investigations. They will bring on phony experts on TV to say this is a violation, that's this, that's that. And it's never ending. And the Supreme Court ordered this. There's a silver lining, not for President Trump, but for the Republicans on Capitol Hill. And I'm telling you, I'm going to hold their feet to the fire. This is no joke here. We're not patsies here. The only thing we are special pleaders for is liberty and the truth. You're going to investigate the Biden family? The House Judiciary Committee? The House Oversight Committee? then you need to see the tax returns of every Biden family matter, a member who is in the Biden crime family. Hunter Biden's tax returns, James Biden's tax returns, the rest of the extended family, and Joe Biden's tax returns. Now, I understand being a sitting president and an ex-president raises different constitutional issues. That said, the prior Treasury Department refused to release Donald Trump's tax returns. When Biden came in, he waived it and said, go ahead, release them. Now, there are compelling arguments that can be made. I don't like where we are with this, but the Democrats and the courts have brought us to this point. Surely it's more important to know, for Congress to know, given its oversight responsibilities, Surely it's more important for Congress to know how the tax code is being used, this is their argument, by a sitting president than an ex-president. By a sitting president than an ex-president. It's more relevant to separation of powers. Donald Trump isn't even in that equation anymore as an ex-president. And you should be concerned that now if private citizens can have their tax returns turned over to Congress, nobody's safe. Nobody. Including you. Including you. That's what the Supreme Court did today. Because the, the pretext that the Democrats in Congress have been using is we want to make sure our tax code is being used properly, it's not being abused, in case we need to make any legislative fixes, you see. Now that is preposterous. So they played this whole game in Washington, D.C. The courts, the Democrats in Congress, the Supreme Court. And part of this is because they've tried to make Trump so persona non grata generally that anything goes now, anything, anything. Can raid his home, can accuse him of this and get doesn't matter doesn't matter again I'm talking as a lawyer here okay I'm talking as a constitutionalist not as somebody endorsing this that or the other candidate so stick with me you know this you're in the audience so now tax returns are fair game your tax returns are fair game to hand a political hacks of the opposite party in Congress because now Trump's tax returns are fair game. If they can get Trump's, they can get yours. Well, he's an ex-president. He's a private citizen, period. Just remember, Congress does not have authority to conduct criminal investigations. So these are legislative oversight, which is why the whole thing makes no sense. Legislative oversight of what, an ex-president? Now that argument makes a lot more sense. I don't like where we are. But that argument makes a lot more sense 
if the Republicans on the House Judiciary Committee, when they take control, if the Republicans on the House Oversight Committee, when they take control, now say, okay, we have a legislative purpose. We want to know if Joe Biden is a crook. We want to know if Joe Biden took money from foreign governments, not just in violation of law, but if it's affecting our national security, if it's affecting our intelligence agencies, if it's affecting our diplomacy. He's the sitting president. The ex-president doesn't have any power. The sitting president has all the power. We need to see if this guy was paid off. Well, Mark, he released his tax returns. No, he didn't. He didn't release all of his tax returns. He's got, he set up S corporations. They haven't released those tax returns. Why? Good question. So now everything's on the table. You've got to use the precedent set by the Democrats in the D.C. court system, by John Roberts on the Supreme Court, by the Democrats in the House of Representatives. You now have a massive open field to conduct your investigations. No more attorney-client privilege. No more attorney work product. No more confidentiality. No more, oh, they're private citizens. There's no legislative oversight. The Supreme Court just handed it to you. Now, you Republicans, you get the tax returns for Joe Biden, James Biden, Hunter Biden, and every other damn Biden who's on the take. Every damn one of them. You get their tax returns because now you have a right to get them. And while you're at it, you want all of Joe Biden's records with his private attorneys, with his private attorneys. You want all of Joe Biden's records with his tax attorneys. You want all of Joe Biden's records with his personal accountants. You want it all. Just to make sure the Internal Revenue Code, ladies and gentlemen, isn't being abused and it's working properly. That's all. That's all. And if you do anything less, you're useless. Of course, the Democrat Party media and the Democrats are saying, now they want to investigate. You know what, folks? They can shut the hell up. We don't give a damn what they report, what they say, their dumbass Sunday shows or anything else. We don't care. You got two years in the House to get to the bottom of this. Election victory or no election victory. You have two years to get to the bottom of this. Determining whether the man in the Oval Office is a Manchurian president. Determining whether he's a crook is an important role. One of the most important roles for oversight. And we don't expect Mitch McConnell to lift a finger. 40-yard line, what a 40 Shut up, you idiot, marble mouth. You're a clown. Everyone knows you're a clown. Except the 36 morons who vote for you. But that's very important. Now, I want to talk about this special counsel. What happened here in this case several years ago about the Republican governor, Bob McDonald, who had a hell of a political career ahead of him? Bob McDonald took a lot of gifts. Mostly his wife did, too. At the time, that was not illegal in the state of Virginia. Was it wise? No. Did he commit a federal offense? That's the issue. The Public Integrity Section of the Criminal Division of the United States Department of Justice was headed by this guy, Jack Smith. Jack Smith's wife has done a documentary on Hillary Clinton, excuse me, Michelle Obama, and has donated heavily to the Biden campaign. So these are radical Democrats, very, very partisan. You can assume this U.S. attorney or this head of the public integrity section is the same. So what happened? Well, there's a definition 
in federal law in terms of bribes, official bribes. There's a definition for it in the bribery statutes and the interpretation of it. Basically, it's an official act. An official act done on behalf of somebody as a result of receiving a gift, a quid pro quo. There was no evidence whatsoever that Governor McDonnell had done an official act for anybody. That there was any quid pro quo. But that didn't stop Jack Smith, the new special counsel investigating Trump, from expanding it. From expanding the definition of official act beyond what the statutory definition on the face of it provided. So Jack Smith said, okay, but he had his people set up meetings for some of these people who gave him gifts. He had some people set up meetings. Or he allowed them to attend some public events. Attend public events. And that is an official act. That is a quid pro quo. And the Supreme Court concluded unanimously it was eight to zero. There were only eight members on. And this would include Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Justice Scalia and Justice Thomas and Breyer. And of course, the Chief Justice wrote the opinion. And they said, that's not what the statute says. That's not what the statute is intended to say. The prosecution here overextended itself and interpreted the statute in a way that virtually any conduct would be a criminal offense under the federal bribery statute. And so this broad interpretation of bribery would result in an awful lot of people being charged with federal bribery crimes. And that's not how our system works. You need to be able to lobby people. You need to be able to encourage people to support or oppose legislation on your behalf. Or you need to be able to approach a governor about his bureaucracy that you think is unfair and so forth and so on. But if the governor doesn't act in an affirmative way to deliver something of substance to somebody who gives him a gift, then it can't be bribery. It can't be bribery or every constituent meeting where something exchanges hands in the state it was legal in Virginia becomes bribery. The court ruled eight to zero unanimously. McDonald had been convicted by a jury in Northern Virginia because the federal district judge gave out the wrong instructions at the urging of the prosecutor who was Jack Smith. And this, of course, destroyed Bob McDonald's political career forever. And, of course, the left and the media jumped on this and said, among other things, Bob McDonald could never run for president because he was actually convicted of a crime, even though it was overturned because they're slime balls. Of course, that's preposterous, but nonetheless. And I don't know what's happened to Bob McDonald since. He had a landslide election and brought in everybody under him. Ken Cuccinelli was attorney general. He won. Lieutenant governor won. Republicans controlled three of the statewide offices. Not to happen again until last year with Glenn Youngkin. So that's what happened. And the special counsel was Jack Smith. Mark Levin. We're giving you nothing but the best, the best of Mark Levin. So here's my question for you. You're the Attorney General of the United States. You say, I'm going to appoint a special counsel under federal law, under, under federal 
excuse me, Department of Justice regulations that have been federalized under statute. And the reason I'm going to do this is because it doesn't look good if we here at the Department of Justice continue with this case. And he picks this guy, Jack Smith. He can pick from a million lawyers. There's over a million lawyers in this country. And God knows how many former federal prosecutors. They're everywhere on TV. You've seen them. Some dumber than the rest. But that said, he could have literally picked a person who was above reproach, who had sound prosecutorial judgment. But he picks this guy who lost in a Supreme Court case 8-0 to zero because he abused his statutory authority and the interpretation of the statute to take out a, a promising potential presidential candidate. And you're the Attorney General of the United States, and despite the fact that this guy has this scarlet letter on his forehead, you know he's a liberal. You know he went out of his way to take out a Republican governor. And you further know that um, his wife is a big liberal. What kind of a special counsel appointment is this, America? It's grotesque. I guess the question for me is this. When you appoint a special counsel and the situation creates the appearance of a conflict of interest for the department, shouldn't that raise serious questions in the legal community? Shouldn't that raise serious questions in the media? The corrupt media, of course not. But shouldn't that raise serious questions among Republicans? That this guy has no judgment whatsoever? And that's exactly why he was chosen. Doesn't that make sense? It's not really a special, special counsel if he's just another hitman for the Democrat Party with a very poor record when it comes to the McConnell case, McDonald case. And what's interesting to me is when they put out their statement and when the attorney general introduced that they were going to have a special counsel and the media talked about it, Nowhere in his resume is this humiliating defeat, 8-0, to zero, unanimous by the Supreme Court. Nowhere. Nowhere. 